Well, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to we're going to start our webinar here today. Welcome. Uh, we're really glad you're joining us uh, this evening. We have some amazing people here, um, and from our Midwest Big Ten law schools, and we all think we're pretty great. So we hope uh, we hope we give some good information to you. Uh, this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're, uh, where you're zooming in from. Uh, my name is Janet Hine. I'm the Director of Admissions uh, at Indiana University. Um, and I'm gonna be the moderator for today. Uh, so we have admissions deans, again, from six top law schools with us today to tell you about the admissions process, as well as the advantages of a legal education uh, at a Big Ten uh, Midwest law school. Uh, and then once our presentation is concluded, we will ha be happy to answer questions for you as well. So again, welcome. Uh, I ask that you also uh, use the Q&A for any questions you may have at the conclusion of our presentation. Um, we'll try to get as many in as we can and, um, and then we'll kind of go from there. So uh, I'd now like to introduce you to my colleagues. Um, I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves and then say a little bit about uh, their law school. So since I'm kind of looking like uh, to, my, uh, to my left is actually uh, Dean Michael States from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. So Dean States, if you'd like to introduce yourself, that would be great. Sure, thank you. Uh, good. Afternoon and evening, everyone. My name is Michael States. I am the Dean for Admissions, Financial Aid, and Diversity Initiatives at The Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Uh, we are located on the campus of The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, while the university is just short of 62,000 students, the law school uh, population is just short of 600 students. Uh, the class this past fall had 182 students in it. 60% uh, of them were female students, which is an all-time high for us. 25% uh, of them were students of color. 18% of them uh, self-identify as LGBTQ+, 15% uh, first generation. Uh, our median age is about 22 with the age range for this class of 20 to 44. And the uh, school age range is uh, 20 to 54, I think. Uh, for this incoming class, 34% of the students were from outside of the state of Ohio, coming from 23 states, Washington, DC, and a student uh, from India. Our uh, 75th median, 25th grade point average was a 3.94, 3.79, 365, and the LSAT score was 164, 161, and 158. And I will stop with that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dean States. Um, uh, Dean uh, Becky Ray, if you'd like to introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about uh, U of I. Sure. Thanks, Janet. Um, I'm Rebecca Ray. I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions and Financial Aid at the University of Illinois College of Law. Um, much like Ohio State, we are located on our flagship campus in Champaign-Urbana. Um, and, you know, similarly, our, while the university is large at almost 50,000 students, um, our law school is actually relatively small. We're around 400 students. This year's first year class um, is 157 students. And this year we were 50-50 pretty much on the nose for male-female. Um, and we had more Illinois residents than residents, although in other years that those numbers have been reversed. So in any given year, we're about 50, 50 Illinois residents and non-residents. Um, our student, our first year class is 36% students of color, um, which is among the highest we've had. Um, and we're really proud of that. And the LSAT um, medians and the 25th and 75th are up here. The median was a 162 for LSAT and the median for the GPA was a 3.64. And I put the map of Illinois up there. Um, Champaign-Urbana is on the Eastern side of the state, central Eastern part of the state. And we're about 
two hours south of Chicago, if you're unfamiliar with Illinois. Thank you, Becky. That's great. If you could um, stop share, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, great. Um, and then uh, uh, the next person over in my little square is Dean Collins Bird from University of Iowa. So Dean Bird, please introduce yourself. Greetings, everyone. My name is Collins Bird. I'm the Assistant Dean of Enrollment Management at the University of Iowa College of Law. Uh, we are located in the eastern part of the state. If you're not familiar with Iowa or Iowa City, which is the city we're located in, we're about one hour, almost exactly one hour west of the Mississippi River, and we share the border with Illinois. Uh, this year's entering class, we had 166 students and the total enrollment for the school is 473. And that's one of the things you're gonna find as we talk here is, as I like to tell people, it's very hard for a small school to act big, but it's very easy for a big school to act small. And we'll talk a little bit more about when you hear our presentations, but you'll find that all these campuses have close to 30,000, 40, 50, 60,000 people on it. And our campus total is 30,000 people, but the law school is 473. Within the entering class of 166, we had a uh, LSAT median of 161, a median GPA of 3.64. Our 75th percentile was a 163 and a 3.78. Our 25th percentile was a 156 and a 3.44. We had 60% of our entering class consisting of non-residents, 40% were residents, 54% were female. That is the largest group of uh, female students in the entering class. And uh, we also had 25, just over 25% students of color in the entering class. The female in the entering class, that percentage and the students of color in the entering class are both school records. And as has been mentioned before, that's something we took great pride in because it, it takes a lot of work uh, to manage all the different numbers and things that people look at. Uh, uh, 45, uh, sorry, 54% uh, female, 45% uh, male. There's one person, 1% 1 who's in transition. 7% of our students are first generation students. 9% of our students are LGBTQ. I think those are all the key numbers and I will stop there. Great, thank you, Dean Bird. Um, Director Ingley from University of Minnesota. Hi, thanks, Janet. Uh, yes, I am Robin Ingley, the Director of Admissions at the University of Minnesota in uh, Minneapolis. And I didn't want you to see my email because that's a mess. Uh, but anyway, I'll just uh, quickly throw our profile up here for you to take a quick look at so you can look at the numbers while I run through a few of them. Um, like my colleagues, we are a large urban, a large university. We are set in an urban area. So overall, I believe the University of Minnesota has about 50,000 students. I don't get to leave my office much, so I really don't see many of them. But I do get to see our awesome law students, of which we have about 700 in the building right now. Um, so our entering class size, as you can see here, was 213. Um, our median LSAT, which isn't there, was 165, and you can see the ranges. Uh, the median GPA was a 3.77. Um, we are proud that uh, this was our fourth year running where we were majority female at 54% this year. Um, we also had 24% of the entering class were LGBTQ uh, folks and then 25% were students of color. So again, very happy with those numbers. As Colin says, it takes a lot of work to uh, bring in a nicely diversified group of a group of students. Um, we are 68% uh, of our students came from outside of Minnesota. Um, and we had seven countries uh, in this, this year's entering class. 4% of our students were international this year. Typically, that's closer to um, nine to 10%. But because of the pandemic and other issues, uh, we were not able to get as many of, of our admitted international students here to campus, but they are excited to join us next year. Um, yeah, with, you know, we have a very uh, low student faculty ratio. Our students have a lot of opportunities to interact with faculty at an eight to one student faculty ratio. Very happy about that. Additionally, our outcomes are great. Um, you know, we had 98% uh, bar uh, passage in July. So we're very pleased with that. Uh, and 94% employment uh, for the last class we have data on. Um, and just in case you don't know where um, Minneapolis St. Paul is, uh, uh, Dean Bird mentioned um, near the Mississippi, about an hour away. Well, I got you beat. 
because we're right on the Mississippi River. Um, in fact, I can see it from my window and I walk across the bridge every day. Uh, the Twin Cities is the 16th largest urban area in the US uh, and we have everything here that um, other, other large metro areas have as well. From there, I will hand it off and stop sharing the screen. Great, thank you, Director Ingley. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Associate Dean Scheller. Great, and I will do the same. I'll see if my screen will allow me to share my uh, fact card that has all of our data on there as well. Um, and as Dean Bird mentioned, yes, we are uh, all very similar in that way in that we are on large campuses with very small close-knit law school communities. Um, here you can see our most recent data for our fall 2020 entering class. Uh, we came in at about 241. Uh, we have our ranges right there for the LSAT with the median at 163. The GPA ranges right there with a GPA median of 3.61. Um, you can see down at the bottom, the states with the most students enrolled, they come from all over the place. Certainly uh, a large percentage come from within our state. This year was the highest percentage that we've seen in several years with 53% coming from inside of the state and 47% coming from around the country and around the world. Um, and that is pretty consistent. It is about a 50-50 split within our school um, for students coming from within the state of Wisconsin and then coming from all over the place. Um, as Director Ingley mentioned, we usually have a, a larger international population that was a little bit smaller this year, but many of those students are still um, attending, just attending remotely from Shanghai and from Beijing and from Seoul, South Korea, and, uh, and even from Mexico. So, um, so they are all over the place uh, and part of this year's entering class. Um, you can see that with a class size of 241, our students actually come from 119 different undergraduate institutions. And so of course, many of those are coming from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but after that, it's uh, almost a one-to-one -one ratio of students per school, which really um, helps contribute to the um, geographic diversity that we see in the class and kind of that life experience diversity as well. Um, we are, as you can see from my background, uh, located in the state capital. Um, so you can see the state capital right back there. We are located on an isthmus. So we are between two bodies of water, which means there's a lot of outdoor activities um, that our students participate in, whether that is um, sailing on one of the lakes or um, even doing some of those winter sports like snowshoeing or, or even ice fishing. Um, we always have some students from Houston and San Diego that are excited to participate in that. Um, as you saw on, on the, the fact card as well, something to highlight, our average age did go up just a little bit. I think the average age is now 25.14. We're usually right around 25 and the age range uh, for this year's class was 19 to 52. Um, we do have 26% students of color in our class, about 11% are first generation students, um, and about another 11% uh, come from the LGBTQ plus community. So um, proud of that diversity here at Wisconsin as well. Back to you, Janet. Great, well, thank you. Well, I have to say um, our assistant dean of admissions is continuing to have technical issues. So I'm gonna talk about IU Mauer School of Law here in beautiful Bloomington, Indiana, just for a minute or so, and then we'll kind of delve into the admissions process a little bit. So we are about an hour south of Indianapolis uh, in a typical college town, as many of us are. Um, and uh, again, it's about 46,000 students on the entire campus, whereas the law students are about four to 500 at the law school. Um, just to give you some quick statistics, our median GPA was about a 378 this past year, median LSAT of 162, about half our students are women and about 20% of our students do claim an ethnic minority background. Um, our average age is about 24, that's pretty typical but we do have about 60% of our students who take at least one year off of school. And our students, like you know the other schools here, we do attract folks from all over the country. About 40% of our students are Indiana residents and 60% are from everywhere. I would say probably the next states, feeder states for us are Michigan, uh, Ohio, uh, some Illinois and then California. Um, and then we turn around and place folks back again, 40% in the state and about 60% out of state. Um, we are typically considered one of the most beautiful campuses in the country. And I've, I've worked near or at where some of my colleagues are right now. And I would say we all have pretty amazing campuses. I do, Bloomington is kind of in my heart now. So um, it is a beautiful campus and, and that does, you know, make learning as I think 
on all of our campuses, uh, much more convenient if you're in sort of a pleasant place, right, where you want to be. Um, I'm the, some of the just quickly some of the programs we're known for our intellectual property program, our uh, international law program, our business law program, and our tax law program. Um, but like my colleagues, you know, and we'll talk about this later, is that that we offer a wide variety, and a lot of opportunities for uh, any of your legal areas. So I'm going to stop there and I think we'll move on to the admissions process here. Um, again, we have assistant deans and directors sitting here who've read many, 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 many files at this point in their careers. So uh, applications. So I think um, you'll get a wealth of good information and knowledge from all of us. So I'm going to start with um, Dean States and ask him to talk a little bit about ELSA testing and academics as part of your application. So Dean Stage, you wanna pick it up from there? Sure, so I am going to uh, apologize ahead of time because I'm gonna give you a lot of information in a very short period of time, which means I'm probably going to talk really fast. So uh, we'll have a Q and A section afterwards and you can feel free to ask questions about anything that I, I covered too quickly or that I, that I didn't. Uh, cover and actually I'm also going to apologize for my timer going off at the end of my presentation because I'm about to start it now. So uh, the, the, the first thing is that with regards to the, the academic information, most of it I'm going to talk about uh, in the context of the Credential Assembly Service Report. So the, the first thing about the academic information is, well, let's just start with the, with the LSAT or a test. Uh, a test of, of some kind is required for every applicant, be that the LSAT or the, the GRE. And we are not a GRE school. And so I'll leave it to, I don't know if any of us here are G, GRE school. Okay, so at some point, if you have GRE questions, um, you, can, you can have those for the, the Q&A and, and uh, IU Mauer can answer those uh, for you. But with regards to that, uh, let's start with the LSAT. So right now, the administration of the LSAT is the LSAT FLEX. And the, the FLEX is, of course, the test that is taken uh, either at your home or at some, uh, some private location uh, where you're taking it alone. Most, if not every law school in the country is treating the LSAT FLEX the same way that they would treat the, the standard LSAT if you will. So you shouldn't be concerned that, you know, I, I, I'm taking the flex and it's going to be treated differently, or probably more importantly, I've had people saying, well, I want to wait to take the regular LSAT. And my, you know, my suggestion to them is that, well, this is going to be the way the test is administered for the near future. So if you're planning on going to law school uh, anytime soon, you probably should go ahead and take the LSAT flex. But again, you shouldn't be concerned that it's going to be treated differently than other tests. For those schools that are GRE schools, the only thing that I'll say about that is remember that even for GRE schools, if you take the LSAT, that score will be reported to those schools as well. So they will have both your GRE score and your LSAT score. So be aware that that score gets reported even to the, the GRE schools that you are applying to. Uh, obviously, it, it helps to prepare properly for the test, uh, take as much time as you need to you know, perform at your, your optimum level and, and don't necessarily be uh, convinced by those who say, you know, if you, you need to take only 10 weeks or if you take more than 10 weeks, you're taking too much time. The idea is for you to prepare as much as it as required by you to do as well as you can do. Uh, oftentimes, we're asked about the LSAT and why you know why do you use it the way that you use it or why does it carry so much weight? Uh, the the one thing about the LSAT is that it's the common denominator of every file and, and every application. It's the one thing that's the same. I mean, everyone will have a college degree, but the degrees will come from in different institutions. The majors will be different, but the LSAT is the same for everyone. So in addition to the predictive power that it has in conjunction with the grade point average, um, it is the one thing that we can compare all applicants uh, alike on. 
Uh, I'll, I'll skip down to the, or I'll sort of move on to the credential assembly service because there's, there's a couple of things about that, particularly with regards to grade point average and major, et cetera, that I would like to, to, to point out. The first thing is that this, we, you, know, the, the, you have to submit all of your transcripts for institutions that you've attended to the Law School Admissions Council when you create your credential assembly service report. And what happens is LSAC takes all of that information and puts it in a report for all of the law schools that you are applying to so that you don't have to send all of those transcripts to each institution that you are applying to. The other thing that they do is they standardize grade point averages so that, again, we have somewhat of a consistent way of comparing grades for every applicant who is applying to us. So if your school is on a, a semester system or a quarter system, or if your school is on a four point scale or a six point scale or a 12 point scale, all of those grades get standardized into a semester 4.0 grade scale. So again, we can compare applicants somewhat similarly. Now, obviously we're gonna have your transcripts and we're gonna do more in-depth analysis of your, your transcript, but that's one way of sort of standardizing grades and 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 uh, academic information to make it easier for schools to process that information. The other thing that you should know, though, is that even though all of that information is standardized into a cumulative grade point average, we also get something called the degree grade point average, which is the grade point average that your institution says that you have with them. And typically that is made up of courses that you've taken at that institution in pursuit of your degree. So we will see, for example, if you attended more than one institution or if you transferred from one institution to another institution, we're able to see uh, the differences in those grades, not only cumulatively, but across the years as well. So the, the, the Credential Assembly Service Report also gives us your grades in every year uh, that you were that you were in a particular institution. So a lot of times people will wonder about, you know, well, I attended, you know, this particular school and someone might have attended, let's say an Ivy League school, are you going to look at my school differently? Uh, where again, that's it's school specific, but generally we're more likely to compare you to your peers than we are to compare you to people from other institutions. And the CAS report also allows us to compare you to your peers by also providing for us the GPA, uh, the, coll the, the college mean for your, for your particular institution and the LSAT mean for your particular institution. So again, we can compare your grade point average and your LSAT score to those of your peers. I, 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 will, I will stop there because my, my time is almost up. Obviously there's a lot more information uh, that we could provide you about this. And you also have access to this report and the information that we see. So you can also take a look at it and get some sense of the information that we're, we're seeing. For those of you who are further out in your um, sort of on this, you know, on this journey, the only thing that I would say to you is be conscious of the choices that you make with regards to withdrawing from courses or just not attending courses. Be aware of how that's going to look on your transcript when we're reviewing your applications. And with that, I will stop. Great, great. Thank you, Dean States. Um, I think uh, Director Ingley is gonna talk a little bit about the recommendation and the character and fitness part of the application. So Director Ingley. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't have a timer, so I'm not nearly as organized as Dean State. Hey, we don't have to be that quite that strict, you know. We okay. <laughs> um, well, first off, uh, letters of recommendation. Uh, you know, each school has different requirements for how many they will actually require. Um, so read those applications, those instructions carefully for each school. At Minnesota, we just require one and we will accept up to two. Um, my colleagues here may require two or may require zero. So each school is a little different. Um, what do we want to see in a letter of recommendation? Um, and these are important uh, for a candidate on the bubble, so to speak. Letters of recommendation could actually tip a candidate one way or the other to admit to or deny, uh, depending on what that recommender has to say. So um, when you're seeking out recommenders to write these uh, recommendation letters for you, 
search out people who know you really well. So we're looking for people, for those of you who are still in school and will be applying to law school, probably right after you finish undergraduate uh, college, uh, university, excuse me, just then get a couple professors, most likely is who you're going to find to write these letters for you. You want the professors you choose to be people who um, um, you've taken classes with maybe more than one class, maybe you've had great interactions outside the classroom with them, you sought out their advice, you've talked with them about your passions and your interests. Um, so find those uh, professors who know you well and can speak to your ability to be successful in a, in a rigorous academic environment. Um, and it does help too that if you're out of school for a while but you do wanna go back to a professor and have them write a letter for you, share your resume with them and also probably share your personal statement with them. And that's good advice regardless of if you're still in undergrad with that professor or you're out of it so that they just know where you're coming from and remember all the details about you. Um, I would suggest too that it, maybe you've had a great internship experience or some work experience while you're in undergrad and you also wanna have an employer letter, that's fine. If you wanna have an academic and an employer or internship supervisor letter, that's, that's great as well. Again, we're looking for detail in these letters. It's not uncommon for uh, me to read letters that are two pages long and effusive about candidates. What is uncommon is when I read one that's only a couple paragraphs and I can tell that the letter writer is only lukewarm about the person. So I would um, suggest you ask the person who's going to be a reference, are you comfortable and willing to write a strong letter of recommendation for me? Um, that's a hard question to ask. These are uncomfortable conversations, but you know, if the person isn't comfortable with that, it does not behoove you to um, submit a letter that is not um, you know, really strong for you and, and advocating strongly for you. Um, let, it doesn't do you any uh, good, I believe, in my opinion, I think my colleagues will agree to uh, get a letter from somebody who's, is, it's basically a name drop, right? Like, Oh, I know Senator Amy Klobuchar because, you know, my mom's her neighbor and she saw me grow up. Yeah, but she doesn't know anything about your academics. So don't send me that letter. Now, if you interned in her office or you were her chief of staff on the road um, and that person, you know, that person can submit that letter. That's really great. Um, another uh, suggestion I have is don't have any family members or close friends um, write letters for you. I've seen that doesn't help. Um, also, don't have your hairstylist write a letter for you. I've seen that, and while the guy had good hair, that was about all I learned about him. So anyway, so those are some tips on letters of recommendation. Happy to answer any questions later if you have any. Um, moving on to my not fun part of this presentation about character and fitness issues. Um, so I'm sure you all aware that you have to, you know, answer yes or no to some questions about have you ever been charged with a legal violation? Um, have you ever been suspended or put on any sort of warning from your academic institution? There are other questions that may be on the application. Each law school is different for what they are asking. Read those questions very carefully. You must disclose anything that the law school is seeking if you've had a violation or um, uh, been in any sort of trouble uh, because you'll have to tell, you have to tell law school and then you have to tell the board of bar examiners about it. And if these applications do not match, even though you'd fill them out three or four years apart, you will be in a world of hurt. I'm just gonna go with that. It causes a lot of paperwork and headaches on the back end. So please just err on the side of disclosing. If you have questions, that's why we are here. We are a resource for you. Feel free to reach out to the admissions office if you are unclear, if you need to disclose something. But yes, if, the, if you've had a minor in possession, you may need to disclose that. You may need to disclose traffic viol minor traffic violations. Um, it really depends on the wording of the question. Um, so please do pay attention to that and don't freak out that if you have to disclose something and you think it was serious and maybe it really was, you won't have to, um, it doesn't preclude you from admission to a law school or potentially to the bar, but that's something you'll wanna check out as well. Um, yeah, and then I just, I'm going to echo what Dean State said about choices. He was talking about choices with your transcript and, you know, um, and taking classes and withdrawing. I'm just going to say when it comes to character and fitness, make good choices. The choices you make now can impact your future, regardless of whether you go to law school or not. So just make good choices. Again, happy to answer more questions about that later on. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Director Ingley. Um, 
I think next we're going to go to Dean Collins Bird and he's going to talk about personal statement and resume and just so you know we could spend a whole session on many of these topics so as as Dean State said we have a short amount of time because we want to get to your questions so um, Dean Bird. Okay, thank you very much and uh, welcome back. Uh, you're right, personal statements are something that uh, I really enjoy. It's a very important part of the application process. And what I'd like to do when I start off with this piece is to talk a little bit about why people attend law school, because that's gonna have a huge impact on what you say and what you write in your personal statement. Some people wanna go to law school because they wanna know what lawyers know. There's a specific area of knowledge, a body of knowledge in a very specific area or specialization, and they know that that's the kind of law they want to practice. So for many people, they'll write a personal statement that eventually answers that question of why they want to know that area of law. And then there's some people who want to do what lawyers do. They don't necessarily know what uh, specific area of law they want to practice, but they know that they like the idea of legislation, management, policy development. And those are things that they are going to write about in the personal statement. And then there are some people who write a personal statement, write a personal statement because they want to know what lawyers know and do what lawyers do. Many of those people are multifaceted. I call it, they, they like to cross pollinate, if I could use that term or, or concept, but they end up usually going into joint degrees because they have a lot of different interests. They want to know what lawyers know but they wanna have some management skill or, exe or uh, executive responsibility for implementing the plan. So they go into joint degree programs. But the bottom line is before you enter law school, it's a good idea to have some idea as to why you want to enter the profession. Now we know that there's a better than 50-50 chance that you're gonna change your mind. In fact, about 50% of the people who start law school in this country are clueless as to what they wanna do, but they're smart enough to figure it out. 40% have a clue, but are gonna change their minds. They come in wanting to do this, they graduate doing that. You're not sure how they went from this to that, but there you go, they're doing that whole dance and it all works out. There are only about 10% of the people in, in my experience, 10% of the people who start law school who have a pretty clear idea as to what they wanna do. Most of those people are usually intellectual property folks. There are also some civil rights, uh, public, uh, public policy, public interest, environmental law, but it's a very small percentage. But the thing is you have to know or have some idea as to why you want to enter law school and why, to use Director Hines' term, why you need a law degree. Not necessarily why you want one, but why you need one, because that's gonna drive you through those difficult days. Uh, as I like to tell people, I, I, I work with a, a school of psychology up in Minnesota, it's the Ad Adler Graduate School. And the founder, and it's a name for a person named Alfred Adler, he had this term. He said, follow your heart, but take your brain with you. And that's what we're asking you to do in the personal statement is to tell us where your heart is, but tell us about the thought process that got you to the point of saying, I need a law degree to solve these problems. Now, the other piece to think about this is you think about the application. The application consists of a number of things. Uh, you heard Dean States talk about the LSAT and the GPA. Those are the things that help us in some way or measure, help us figure out the can do of this whole process. Do you have the intellectual ability to compete with the average student at our respective schools? But everything else in that application is usually separated from the academic side and it's more in the non-academic sense. What I call the will do, which is the motivation and the perseverance to get a law degree, the fit, by that I mean, do you have a sense of where you fit in in the profession? You don't have to necessarily sell your soul to a specific area, but you have a pretty good idea as to what you wanna do. And then you have focus, which is that specific area. And then leadership. Do you have a sense of the responsibility and the leadership that you are going to inherit? Because once you earn a law degree, you will be asked to be a leader in your community, whether it's the leader of a country or the leader of a school board, leader of a stadium commission, leader of something. Do you have a sense of that level of responsibility and can you take that on? So in the personal statement, you wanna tell the admissions committees what you really want them to know about you, why you need a law degree, 
Again, using the term that I learned from Director Hine. Why do you need a law degree? And tell us your story. Tell us about the problems you want to solve in society or in a particular area, and then work your way back to how a law degree is going to help you solve that problem. And that personal statement is what tells us about that stream of consciousness that says, here's the problem I want to solve, and here's how I got to needing a law degree to solve that problem. So you can talk about that problem. And then there are some people who will write a personal statement that talks about the skill sets. They have no idea why they want to go to law school or necessarily what practice of area of law they want to practice. But there are some skill sets that they want to develop and refine. And here are what I'll call my big six. I mean, there are different ways to describe it. But law school is going to do six things to you or for you, depending on what kind of day you're having. First, it's going to make you read a lot, more than you ever thought you'd want to read. It's going to make you write a lot. The most important skill you can have as a law school student and as a practicing attorney is your ability to write. You're going to be writing a heck of a lot. It's going to make you research a lot. Being able to go into a law library and or any kind of online research database and find data and information to support your position is going to be important. You're going to be asked to speak in public at some point, whether it's a small classroom or country of 330 million people, you're going to have to speak in public. Think critically. Don't believe everything you see, read, or hear. There are multiple sides to every story. And the final thing is I have a healthy respect for history because judges make decisions based on precedent and precedent is just another name for history. So some people write a personal statement that will say, I'm not sure what area of law I wanna go into, but here are the skills that I have and the skills that I wanna refine over the course of the next three years. Because I know I'm really good at reading, writing, research, speaking in public, thinking critically, having a healthy respect for history and law school will take advantage of that. Some of the, the examples of things that you can use to help start writing your personal statement is to think about your educational experiences. Maybe there's some courses you took in political science or philosophy, or maybe even math, because math is logic, and you're gonna be studying a lot of logic or dealing with a lot of things involving logic in your math courses. But there's something you learned in your educational experience that has driven you to decide to go to law school. Maybe it's your work experience. Maybe it's some activities that you had outside of work or school. Or maybe it's just some personal experiences, both good or bad or neutral that you had that have driven you to decide to go to law school. But those are the things that you can use to help start outlining your personal statement and helping to define the problems that you wanna solve long-term. Final uh, couple of points that I'm gonna be quiet. You wanna type your personal statement. Every now and then we'll get handwritten personal statements. And God bless the handwritten personal statements and the people who write them uh, because Perhaps they can't afford a typewriter. They don't have access to a laptop or something like that. But it's important to do everything you can. To, if you can't type it, find someone who can type it for you. Type that personal statement. Number two, if possible, use double spacing. It sometimes becomes difficult on the eyes to read the single space personal statements that can sometimes go about three pages long or more. But at least to the final point, follow the length guidelines and format guidelines of the schools you're interested in. If a school says, I want three page personal statement or 1500 words, make sure you write a three page, pers page personal statement or 1500 words. This is old saying I learned long time ago when it comes to personal statements and applications. It goes like this, the thicker the folder, the thicker the kid. If we ask for a three pager, three page personal statement and you send me one that's five or six, I think my personal record is 22. That's a problem. If I ask for say two, no more than three letters of recommendation and you send me 19, which is my personal record, that's a problem. Stay within the limits and guidelines of the schools that you're interested in and you'll be okay. I will stop at that point and turn it back to Janet. Great, thank you. 
That was all great advice. We can, I, I know we've been answering some questions in the Q and A and we'll continue to try to do that, but then we'll, we'll, um, po you know, we'll talk about some a little bit later. Um, so, you know, what we're going to talk about now um, briefly are, are some of the advantages of our schools, right? So we all work at Midwest Big Ten Law Schools, um, highly ranked law schools, and we think they're pretty great, but not everybody knows that they are. So we want to make sure you all know some of the advantages of why our schools and maybe not some other schools you may be looking at so you have all this good information. So I'm gonna start and talk just about um, sort of the, the academic opportunities you might have at a Big Ten campus. You may have them at other schools, but I think the opportunities at a Big Ten campus are gonna be very broad and varied and there's gonna be a lot of them. So, um, so that's what I'm just going to touch on uh, here as well. One of them is our joint degree programs. Okay, we all, all of our campuses have joint degree programs. And the beauty of a Big Ten um, school law school is that you have a variety of those, right? It's not just one program. It may be 20. It may be five. Um, but most of us, I think all of us have processes set up for that. Um, for I'll, I'll point to IU and I know others have these programs. All of us have MBA programs you can get while you're getting a JD. Um, we also have a public environmental affairs. Those are probably our two top populated programs. Um, so just that's something to think about certainly at a Big Ten campus. You're going to have a lot of opportunities for that. And not only that, but some of us do have JD PhD programs or even JD MD programs. Um, and we can all speak to that a little bit later, but but those are the great opportunities you're gonna get at, a, at schools uh, that, that we are at. Um, the other thing is, you know, think about the big land grant institutions. There's going to be a lot of faculty, a lot of different programs, and a lot of research and collaboration going on. And so law students can certainly take advantage of that. Um, you know, faculty sometimes cross teach, right? They might teach, you know, environmental law professor might teach in geography or uh, public affairs or the, you know, business for lawyer or accounting for lawyers course might be taught by a business law professor or a business professor. So you're going to have that nice collaboration um, and kind of cross cross collaboration of some of the academic opportunities that you'll have. Um, we also can, you know, draw on faculty and others on our campuses for guest speakers, guest lecturers, uh, special uh, conferences and they're right here and they are all of our schools have world renowned experts and that's a great thing to have when you're in law school right you can really talk to some amazing people and learn from them not just your law faculty um, the the last thing I'll talk about is some of the oh sort of physical but now virtual things that might be available and that's um, some of the centers, some of the libraries, and and again, the centers with research, research centers going on. So at our schools, you're gonna have great access to some of these great libraries um, for your own research, for your own knowledge. So not just the law libraries and not just the legal, um, legal information that may be available online, but a lot of other information mm -hmm. that other departments may have. So that's another thing you can do. Um, and then, you know, you can work and participate in a lot of centers on campus. Um, IU's got a cybersecurity center, it used to be headed by a law professor, no longer is, but that doesn't mean law students aren't involved in that. And that is tangentially related to law school, but it's also related to a lot of other departments. So that's where that cross collaboration comes in as well. So law students can take advantage of that. So I think it just really to end, I'll, I'll say it gives a very rich, deep and broad um, opportunity for our law students if they just choose to get their JD at our law schools. Um, I'm going to turn turn this over now to Dean Scheller, who's going to talk maybe about some other uh, great opportunities of, the, of a Big Ten campus. Absolutely. So um, I'm just going to share my screen real quickly here. Um, all right. So I, I got the, the exciting section of the social resources and cost savings of attending a, a Midwest Big Ten law school. Um, so we're going to get started uh, and touch on some of these uh, topics here, including recreation, arts, technology, 
culture and diversity, food, which is of course a big piece of it, and then overall the Big Ten campus feel. Um, so we're gonna start out with recreation and I just wanna give a quick shout out to Indiana uh, because Janet is the one that brought all of us here together tonight. So I'm gonna start with them. Um, and some of you may actually be on our campuses at this very moment. Many of you are perhaps elsewhere around the country and around the world. Um, so some of you may be familiar with a few of these, these pictures that I'm gonna show you and they aren't going to be of our law school buildings. They aren't gonna perhaps even be of our campuses, but it's just to give you a flavor of the types of things that are happening in these great vibrant communities. And as Janet says, uh, said that there are many common themes among all the Big Ten schools. Um, they are large land grant institutions with interdisciplinary opportunities across campuses with top flight researchers and certainly very active student bodies. Um, so here you can see a picture uh, from Indiana University. This is a picture of the Little 500, which is billed as the world's greatest college weekend. So this is the largest collegiate bike race in the United States. So they are held in Bloomington. Janet, I don't know if you've ever participated in it, but maybe you should. You'll have to think about that one. Um, it's modeled after the Indianapolis 500. So many of you know that, um, uh, that, that race, of course, and that kind of history that they have there in Indiana. Um, and so riders compete in four-person teams around a quarter-mile cylinder at Bill Armstrong Stadium. So um, with this, you can see that uh, Bloomington, as many of our other Big Ten cities, are um, some of the most bike-friendly places in the country. So if you're looking for the outdoors, definitely consider a Midwest Big Ten Law School. Um, looking at the arts, I was talking with Director Ingley about this. This is fascinating. Um, this is a picture of the Frederick R. Weissman Art Museum, which is, a, as you can see, a shimmering multi-angular showpiece that overlooks the Mississippi River. So um, it's, of course, striking itself, but to be able to go inside and see one of the many 25,000 works um, would be pretty impressive. Or you could look out the window and have that stunning view of, of the Mississippi. Um, it also features uh, ceramics and ancient Native American pottery and traditional Korean furniture. And so really a center of modern art and historical art there in Minneapolis, uh, as well as, again, many of our other Big Ten uh, homes. Um, taking a look at tech, and again, you may even see this on commercials. Many of the Big Ten schools are featured as tech hubs, and certainly that happens at the University of Illinois. Um, I think any of you who are into technology, technology geeks, people with STEM backgrounds love this. You will feel as though you hit the jackpot with champagne. This is actually a picture of the Blue Water supercomputer. Uh, Dean Ray tells me that she drives past it regularly during the normal times when she's not um, working from home. Um, this is the fastest supercomputer on a university campus and one of the most powerful in the world. Um, they also have a fab lab, which is another uh, great destination if you're into 3D printing and if you are looking to get some hands-on experience with uh, technological gadgets. Um, I will say something unique about the University of Illinois is that it actually has the second largest international population among public universities. So pretty impressive um, for you know, a place uh, right in the middle of the country attracting people from all over the world as many of our Big Ten institutions do. Um, let's talk about culture and diversity. And for that, we're going to shine a light on uh, Ohio State or the Ohio State. I think it's what I'm supposed to say, Michael. Um, this is a picture of the Columbus Pride Festival and Parade. It is home to one of the largest pride parades in the Midwest and every June. This one attracts more than 700,000 people and over 180 downtown vendors. Um, Columbus is actually the 15th largest city in the country. With that comes a lot of diversity. Um, and with that also comes a couple of extra sports teams that uh, we might not get in some of our other Big Ten schools, although we'll, we'll certainly talk about sports in a couple of minutes. Um, they do have the NHL team, the Blue Jackets there, as well as the MLS team, the Columbus Crew SC. So um, a lot happening there, certainly in Columbus as well. Looking at food, and I think my colleagues all know that I love food, so I, but I should probably share that all of us admission deans, we see each other on the road when we travel quite a bit. Um, and I think they all know that I'm pretty into food, so this is why I got to feature Madison here. Um, so this is a picture of our state capitol building. You will see that uh, right, what's happening right outside of it is the largest producer-only farmer's market in the country, happens in Madison, Wisconsin. Again, right between the two bodies of water that you can see in my background right now. So 
um, certainly a lot of action there. It is from April through November. I would say that in Madison, um, it's surprising the number of restaurants that we have that include nationally acclaimed chefs, James Beard winners. Um, it is a destination city for food as well as some of the surrounding communities. Um, there is no shortage of farm to table action happening in Madison and the surrounding communities as well. Um, so there's a highlight for Wisconsin. Looking at the Big Ten campus, I wanted to, of course, shine a light on Big Ten football. There is nothing like the energy that you see on campus on a Big Ten football Saturday. And I wanted to highlight one of my favorite stadiums, Kinnick Stadium, over in Iowa City. Um, some of you may have seen this on ESPN. It started several years ago. They uh, have a tradition there. Of course, tradition is big within the Big Ten um, called the Iowa Wave. And at the end of the first quarter, everyone waves to the children who are watching from the children's hospital that overlooks the stadium. And so that is a big tradition over there at Iowa. Another uh, great example of one of the strengths of being part of a Big Ten community. Um, and then I did want to just touch on the affordability, of course, of joining a Big Ten school. I think that one of my colleagues mentioned, or maybe a couple mentioned, uh, a big poll from California. I think probably all of us have large California cohorts, and that is because we have much more affordable tuition. Um, we have affordable communities, again, college towns, college cities. Um, whenever I, um, you know, we're bringing in students from New York City or Los Angeles, which happens every year, um, you know, they are so excited they come to my office and they'll say, oh, Dean Scheller, this is great. I can rent out the penthouse in this great high rise over here for what I can get for a studio in New York City. And I always have to dial it back with them a little bit because of course, I'm also responsible for their financial aid, um, but it's always you know, surprising for them. And I think that's a, a pretty universal experience at schools within the Midwest. You're gonna find affordability throughout. And when you're thinking about um, higher education as an investment, you really do need to be thinking about that overall cost and that student loan debt that you might have. Um, similarly, being on some of these large Big Ten campuses, you have numerous free activities that are available to you. Um, and I will say one point of pride among all of our Big Ten uh, colleagues is that we are all very aggressive, I would say, when it comes to providing scholarships to our students. That is a priority for all of us. We all kind of share that data and share in making sure that our students are taking out as minimal debt as they possibly can. And if you look at our average debt for all of our schools, you will find that it is well below the national average by the tens of thousands in some cases. So, um, so that is a little bit of the highlight of the social scene uh, and all of the different resources that are available to you in our communities, as well as the affordability aspect. So I will back out of this and I will turn it over to Dean Ray. Thanks, Dean Scheller. And I think that talking about the social advantages of being on a Big Ten campus segues perfectly into talking about the alumni bases and the advantages um, of the access that you have to the alumni bases. So I took a look at all of our various websites to see what we had to say about our alums. Um, and a couple of themes stood out. We all have alumni bases that range from about 10,500 10, all the way up to 15,000. Um, and these alums are all over the world. And, you know, Dean Scheller mentioned that our international student population at Illinois is large, but I think that's true across the board among Big Ten universities. And our alums quite literally can go anywhere in the world where there might be a need for a lawyer. And um, it's fun to see kind of where people end up when they graduate. Um, in looking at the notable alumni from our various institutions, um, there are things that you would expect to see, like judges and, you know, lawyers working in law firms um, and working for legal aid organizations, some law professors, general counsels of major um, corporations and attorney, attorneys general, um, University of Minnesota, their uh, alum is their current attorney general and has been active in politics. Um, but I also saw some things that you might not expect to see, like CEOs and founders of corporations. I think that's something that maybe people don't realize um, is something that, you know, you can go on and do with a law degree. 
um, and um, athletic directors. I'm working for sports organizations. So, you know, there are, are entertainment lawyers from all of our, our various institutions. So, you know, you can be in pretty much any market you would like to be from um, a Big Ten Midwest law school and doing, um, you know, exactly what you want to do and maybe some things that you haven't even thought about doing. Um, I'm going to briefly talk so we have time to get to questions and answers, but I also want to talk about the ways that our alumni engage with our students. Um, mentorship programs are pretty big among um, law schools and um, having engaged interested alumni who want to chat with students and help them through their careers is I think a really important part of, you know, going to law school. Um, so um, being engaged in those mentorship programs that may exist, and they may exist in several different ways. There may be a formal mentorship program. There also may, that's open to all students. There may be mentorship programs among student organizations um, that, you know, student alumni who participated in particular organizations while they're at these schools may um, have mentorship programs within those um, student organizations. Um, of course, with career planning, there is a lot of alumni engagement, um, and that may include doing mock interviews. Our alumni routinely do mock interviews with our students, um, and I think that is quite, quite common. Um, they also are the ones that will hire, you know, students to do um, summer internships, both at law firms and at corporations. So, um, you know, the, the places that the alumni go also end up being places that the students can work when they're um, either in school or after, after school. Um, networking events are huge among um, Big Ten law schools. And, you know, those are going to range from things like informal panels. You know, most of what's happening in the pandemic is not great. But one positive of it is that these virtual events allow alumni that may be in California right now to engage and be guest speakers in classes um, during, you know, during the semester when they might not otherwise be able to do that or travel to campus as easily. And so, you know, having access and being able to um, telecommute with our alumni base and having more people be comfortable with Zoom and other technologies, I think has been one, you know, positive of, of the pandemic. Um, so having panels, letting our students know what, what a labor and employment lawyer does, what an environmental lawyer does, what an intellectual property lawyer does, um, and start making those connections. Every interaction that you have with an alum is a potential to, you know, indicate your interest after graduating from law school. And if they can't get you a job, they may know somebody who can get you a job. So, you know, just because somebody isn't a hiring part a partner at a loss at a firm or at a corporation doesn't mean that they can't be the avenue to your next legal job. Um, another way that alumni get involved at, I think all of our schools are as adjunct faculty. Um, and they are experts in their fields, and it's a great way um, for them to give back to their colleges that they have, you know, affinity for and to impart their expertise. And it's different than from learning from an academic who, you know, may not be practicing anymore and in some instances maybe never practiced. Um, classes taught by adjunct, adjuncts tend to be focused more on very specific uh, pieces of the practice of law, and they can be excellent teachers and um, give really practical, important advice um, and knowledge when it comes to learning. And I think having um, alumni who are willing to serve as adjunct and active faculty is a real benefit. Um, and then having firm visits and having your, you know, inviting um, students from your alma mater to visit your law firm is another way that our alumni um, can get involved and, and do routinely get involved. Um, I think that's another, you know, wonderful way. Oh my goodness, I have a 
technical problem. Um, uh, so visiting with lawyers um, in their offices as opposed to them coming to the, the college. And I would be interested in, you know, some of us are kind of in our home bases where our larger, where our alumni bases are, but others, and I'm thinking of um, IU in particular and um, us as well, our largest alumni base is not in Champaign-Urbana. And so um, I think sometimes people assume that we're not able to kind of bridge that gap between the alumni and the student body and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the, you know, we're always coming up with new ways to either bring alumni to Champaign, to Bloomington, I'm sure, um, and or to take our students to where our alumni are. So I think, you know, just because the alumni base is not located where the college is, um, doesn't mean that you're not going to get to interact with those um, alums. Um, and our affinity groups are a really important way that our students interact with our alumni. Our Black Law Students Association and our um, Latino Law Students Associations host banquets every spring that have been going on for 25 or more years. And the alumni of those groups are incredibly active um, and have a very strong hand in organizing and attending these banquets. And um, so, you know, the affinity groups are even a smaller niche within the colleges um, and the alumni that were part of those affinity groups have very strong attachments and want to see the students in those affinity groups thrive both while they're in law school and after they graduate. And those are connections that last, you know, their entire lives. So I'll let us go to questions now, um, but thank you. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. I think we've been, uh, a lot of us have been answering questions as you all have been asking them. Um, but, you know, just, you know, financial aid in general, I think we had a lot of questions about scholarships and financial aid and timing. Um, so maybe um, Colin or Dean Bird, if you could maybe talk a little bit about scholarship consideration and sort of the timing in the application pool, when's the best time for that? And what is the timing like at, at Iowa for scholarship decisions? Sure. First thing I'll say is call the schools that you're interested in because each school is going to have a different application deadline for admission, a different application deadline possibly for scholarships, and a different scholarship budget, which is significant in the conversation. Uh, what I tell students is first apply as early in the cycle as you can. Once you find a set of schools, that you're interested in, apply early. And when I say early, I mean by the end of the year. If you're interested in next fall of 2021, I recommend applying no later than December 31 of this year. Now again, call the schools you're interested in because that may vary depending on their budget and the timing of how they do things logistically. That's because many schools, especially public schools, are not going to have as much money as many of the private schools. And so we have to be a bit more careful about how we spend our money because much of the funds that we use is based in, on taxpayer dollars and the money we get from central administration. And they're focused on taxpayer dollars. So again, it's going to vary from school to school. but. You're going to find that public schools in general have a little bit less money than private schools and less flexibility in how they use it. So applying early is important. The LSAT and the GPA are going to be the driving decisions for most of the scholarship decisions because most of the scholarships are going to be merit based. Now there will be some need involved, but I, and I can only speak for myself, at Iowa, we do not ask for any FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. We don't ask for that information in the application process. So we really don't have a good sense of what the true level of need is for a student. We usually have to read the file and get a sense from the personal statement and maybe letters of recommendation and things like that as to what the level of need is. Uh, there are maybe some schools that will ask for a need-based uh, information. I know there are some schools that actually have an application for scholarships. It's a pretty simple one to fill out, but there is a scholarship application and that'll give the school a sense of what your level of need is. So it's important to apply early so you can get all these things done. Get your LSAT done, your GPA done. You'll have that application uh, 
for scholarships done or an application inter or excuse me, scholarship interview, if it's uh, necessary to have one. But applying early will get all those things out of the way. Great things are up happen when you apply early. First of all, if anything gets lost, you can find it. You can recreate it or reproduce it or we'll find it. It might be sitting in, under my desk somewhere or behind the shredder, hopefully not in the shredder. Number two, uh, you have more time to think about the decision. Whether you get in or not, you have more time to think about how you're strategically and tactically going to handle that. Number three, you have more time to think about what you're going to do. Do I go to Ohio State, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Indiana? Do, which school do I go to? You have more time to think about it and maybe do a visit, either a virtual visit or hopefully some kind of an in-person visit. But the biggest thing to applying early is scholarship consideration. I'll give you an example of what happens here at Iowa. We do not have a big scholarship budget. We do the best we can with what we have, but we have to be very careful about how much we spend because we just don't have a big enough budget for what we want to do or where people think we ought to go. But we do the best we can. My application deadline is May 1st. I usually run out of scholarship money sometime around the first week of February. There are years when I can get it into say the first week of March. Now remember, my application deadline is May 1st. And it takes from the time an application comes in the door to the time we get a decision out, it could take anywhere from two weeks to a month because you have to get it in the door, process it, do all these other things to it. And every file gets reviewed. That's another thing to consider. There are no applications, I, and I, I think it's, I speak for all of our processes. There is no one who's offered admission to any of our schools just based on numbers. Someone physically reads that file, but it takes time to get in, into that file and read it. So if you apply early, you'll get at least the budget in place for some consideration. But people in my process, if you submit an application, let's say in early to mid-February, even if you have a 180 and a 4.0, there's a strong possibility that I can offer you admission and not give you, not offer you a scholarship. Even if you're a wonderful person and you're the kind of person that we would all want, because I will have run out of money. So it's important to apply early because each school is gonna be different in terms of its budget, timetable, and the logistical process that it takes to get that uh, scholarship award out to you. Oh, final thing, and then I'll shut up. Uh, most schools, well, some schools will send the scholarship award out along with the offer of admission, but there are some other schools where there may be a gap where you'll get an offer of admission and say a week or two later, you'll get a scholarship award. So again, it all gets back to applying early and you'll be okay. And just to follow up, um, you know, we, we have uh, someone asking about taking the LSAT in January. Um, Dean States, is that okay for your school? Maybe we can just go around real quick to see if that's, that's an okay time or if that's a little late. Uh, yeah, I mean, generally, generally, it's an okay time. I mean, the only thing that I've been telling people is that, um, you know, in a year where applications nationally are up, like almost 50%, uh, and our applications are up exactly 50%, uh, I think timing probably more than ever will be of the essence. And so, you know, particularly when, since we're not traveling, we also have a lot more time to read applications. And so I think for those of us, you know, once we start reading applications, I think we'll be reading more of them and reading and decisions will be going out more quickly. And so that that time frame in which, you know, we start reading and decisions go out, you know, is is going to shrink in terms of us getting to the number of offers that we think we need to make in order to end up with the class size that we want. And so I'm not gonna say that, um, you know, January is late, but my, my, I would suggest that you get the application in and all of the other parts as soon as you possibly can. And then once you have a test score, LSAC will send that to us automatically. And that way, you know, you're not reaching out to them, my apologies, uh, you're not reaching out to them to have them send the score to us. And so that that's what I would say, and feel free to add anything else. Great, great. Yeah, that answered a number of questions. Um, there is a question that I know many people ask and somebody did ask it. So Director Ingley, what do you think about um, taking a gap year? What are your thoughts? And certainly everybody else contribute to that too. Right, um, 
Yeah, I think a gap year, if, if you're burned out, if you're in school now and you're burned out and you want to take a gap year um, and you're just not ready to, you know, take on the, the rigors of law school, then you should take a gap year. Um, if you're taking a gap year just because you read it on a blog that you should, then don't take a gap year. Um, you, you know, the money you forgo, you're going to make more of money when you get out of law school than you're going to make during the gap year. So unless you have a very good reason to take a gap year, I suggest um, applying to law school now if you're ready. If you're not ready, law schools will always be here and will welcome your application. Did I miss anything, my dear colleagues? <laughs> we are not a secret society. We'll be here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I think it goes down to, um, comes down to, you know, everybody's an individual. That's what's right for you. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a personal statement, right? Everybody's an individual. So you may take gap year, you may wait 10 years, you may wait, wait six months. It, it really is such an individual decision. Mm -hmm. So, um, see, we've got somebody and maybe um, Dean Scheller can take this. Um, the, the, we've got a student who's who's asking just about certain areas of law, particularly about intellectual property. Um, just wants to know sort of what we have at each of our schools. So do you want to start, uh, Dean Scheller? Sure. Absolutely. I will uh, kick it off. Um, and I think, again, this is going to be true for many schools, but we'll go around and share. Um, yes, intellectual property. I think I can maybe start with one of our very active student organizations, the Intellectual Property Student Organization called IPSO for short. Um, I would say most students in those classes or in that track have taken some sort of um, either science or uh, some some STEM major in their background, I would say. Um, they end up taking classes in law school like patent law, copyrights, trademarks. A lot of the classes that they take will overlap with the corporate law classes. So business organizations, um, fundamentals of business transactions, tax is another one that comes into play. Um, again, being part of a large research institution, there is some of that interdisciplinarity that comes into play as well. So some of our students will take classes that are cross-listed elsewhere. Um, that could be math, that could be chemistry, that could be um, in a number of different departments. And so um, I would say bioethics is another uh, common class that students will take that's housed within the law school, but that of course is cross-listed within other departments. Um, we also have a clinic that is, gosh, over a decade old now called the Law and Entrepreneurship Clinic. And a lot of students that participate in that clinic will work with, it's oftentimes startup companies that are um, trying to figure out the best path for entity formation. You know, should they be an LLP or an LLC? Where should they incorporate? Often the answer is Delaware, but um, they, they talk about those kinds of things with these clients. And then they also work with them on their patent, copyright, and trademark issues. So they're often collaborating with colleagues over at the USPTO, at the, at the US Patent and Trademark Office, to secure those patents or other IP-related things for those clients. Um, so yeah, so the, the student organization, the classes they take, and then putting it into practice in the clinical program um, makes IP a big strength at Wisconsin. And I'll turn it over to my colleagues to see what other kinds of things are happening at their campuses. Dean, Dean Ray, uh, can you take just a little bit of time to talk about your IP program? Sure. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we have classes in patent prosecution, um, trademarks, copyrights. I, again, I would echo that one of the benefits of being at a major research institution is that there are lots of opportunities hands-on learning when it comes to intellectual property. So, um, and actually she's no longer at Ohio State, but a classmate of mine at Illinois was doing copyright, copyright law at Ohio State. So there are experts in, you know, all of the copy, copyright, trademark, patent law. Um, our students um, in the undergrad and in the graduate programs that are not the law school at Illinois may have inventions or processes that they want to patent. And our students work with them to figure out if their um, inventions are patentable. And that's, that's our patent law clinic. Um, so we also have students who work in the, what's called the tech transfer office. So all of the faculty that are doing research on these universities um, have patents on their, uh, on their IP and they may license it to other organizations. And um, that is a legal 
process and students who are interested in intellectual property work can work in the, um, usually it's called a tech transfer office or something like that, um, can work in those offices on campuses like all of ours um, to, you know, get actual experience doing what it is that you would like to do um, once you graduate, which I think is, is really cool. You know, and I'll just add before I turn it to some other colleagues, um, you know, we all have a lot of these, these programs, um, these opportunities, clinics, uh, IU has a patent law clinic that's very popular. Um, but, you know, you know, hence you see the advantages and all the opportunities of, of a Big Ten large institution, right, that we can really um, rely on not only collaboration, but on sort of the outreach of our faculty and our clinic professors too, and what their expertise in. So I'll see if any of my other colleagues has anything else to add about that um, at all. Okay. I'll, I'll just say it gets back to what I said at the top end where, and I think a number of us have said it, the beauty of working for a large university, research-based university, is there are so many different things that you can go into and you can be in a town or a city where you go, you don't think you have access to something. And then you find out that there is research going on in another graduate program and you can get a joint degree, you can get involved, you can take courses there, have it transferred back. But it gets to what I said at the beginning. It's very hard for a small university to act big, but it's very easy for a big university to act small. And when it comes to graduate education and law school in particular, intellectual property is a perfect example of it. The opportunities that exist to get involved, not just in the research, but in moot court mock trial things, it, it really is incredible. And I've, I've worked at large universities, I've worked at small private colleges and worked, and all the resources that come with working for a large university, it's a blast. Even for someone like myself, and as Robin said, or. Director Ingley said, we're all kind of stuck in our offices here. So, and, and like you, Robin, I'm on the other side of the river. There's a river that goes right through campus and I'm away from central campus. I'm looking at it, but it's about a 10 or 15 minute walk away. But it's just exciting to be in an environment like that where you can have all this research going on. You know, and I think there's, um... I think we have time for a few more questions, but one that, that I've had a lot, and uh, maybe I'll have um, uh, Assistant Dean Ray take this one and we can all, of course, add in, is um, about the student who's looking, maybe looking mainly along the East Coast, not necessarily Midwest, because they are looking toward a place where they want to work when they graduate. How important is that um, in choosing a law school? Um, I mean, you want to make sure that the law school can get you where you want to go, but I don't think that that is necessarily the same as being in that place. So making sure that they have alumni in, you know, if you want to be in New York, making sure that they have alumni in New York and that they can, you know, get you in contact with that those alumni in New York. And I, I don't think, you know, Illinois is unusual. I think we all have alumni in New York and, and they want more of our students um, to be working at their firms and working in their organizations. So, um, you know, just make sure that you have um, asked the questions about where are your alumni located, what kinds of infrastructures exist at the college to connect you with those alumni, and what sort of support can the career planning office um, provide to you to make sure that you are getting plugged into job opportunities in the market where you would like to be after graduation. Um, I also think, you know, talking a little bit about the summers is a really important way to make sure that you can get to the market where you would ultimately like to be after graduation. Um, so if you're from California and you wanna to go to law school in Wisconsin, but you ultimately wanna be on the East Coast, you know, you're know you gonna probably wanna spend your summers in, in the East Coast. And I think that's, that's fine, but just know that and start asking questions now about you know, what, that's, what those summers opportunities might look like um, on the East Coast and sort of you know, 
be ready to tell your story. You know, if you're from New York, you want to spend some time in the Midwest and then you want to return, like be ready to tell employers that story. And we all have offices that can help you find those opportunities, get you connected with the alumni that can, you know, sort of put in the good word, you know, in those situations. And then also, um, uh, the academics, we're all strong, you know, strong institutions that are going to be able to get you, you know, have name recognition and undergrad alumni from our all of our institutions of which there are, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands are also excited to see alumni from the law school, you know, come to their law firms and their other legal organizations. So it's not just the law school alumni, it it extends um, to the undergrad alumni. They they like people who know what it was like to you know do the wave at Iowa or you know go to a, the Ohio State Michigan football game and see see what that you know that rivalry like Big Ten alumni like hanging out with their own. Great, great. Anything to add, uh, anyone else? Uh, yeah, I would, in addition to, I, I always tell people to start with the outcome data at our schools. All of us have data on our websites that tell you, you know, where our, where our alumni want, you know, go after graduation, uh, find out where our, our, you know, our recent grads have taken the bar exam, uh, you know, those kinds of things. I think with the uniform bar exam, some of that is gonna, gonna shift and change. Uh, look at programs that schools have. Does a school have a summer program in a city that you want to, to, to be in? What, you know, do firms from other cities do on-campus interviewing at your schools? I, I think particularly with our schools, our names and reputations are such that you're never going to have to explain, you know, I've never heard of that school before. Tell me about that, right? Like, you, you're just not going to encounter that. And so, that's, you know, that's also one of the, the benefits of attending, you know, a university and a law school with the, with the brand recognition that our schools have. And so, uh, so that, that's something else that I would look at too. But I think, you know, a lot of times, and, and if you are someone from the East Coast or the West Coast who wants to get back to the East Coast and West Coast, don't forget the connections that you have already. And make sure that you know you're letting people know. Look, I'm going to law school at you know the University of Wisconsin this year, but I plan on coming back here. Are there any opportunities during the summer that I can volunteer, or can you connect me with people? Like, don't just you know forget the relationships that you have just because you're going to be attending uh, law school somewhere else. Great, great. I am going to take uh, ask one more question, and I think it's uh, something um, we all have. So if we want to comment, but I'm going to ask it to Associate Dean Scheller. Um, somebody was asking about social justice programs and what your school has to offer in that area. Yeah, I think we are a school that has long been known for social justice. And I think, um, you know, it's exciting to see, as Dean States mentioned earlier, application volume is up quite a bit throughout the country. Um, we're seeing a lot of that interest coming through. And so that's something that aligns with our identity at Wisconsin. And it, it, like I said, it's exciting to see. Um, as far as social justice programs, our student orgs are very, very active and involved. And a lot of that starts with our LEO organizations. And that's the umbrella for, as, as Dean Ray kind of talked a little bit about this too, our Black Law Students Association, Latino Law Students Association, Indigenous Law Students Association, Asian Law Students Association, and Middle Eastern Law Students Association. They uh, have a very active voice within our community. Um, I'm an alum of Wisconsin and uh, was very active with the Latino Law Students Association and we um, did a lot of work within the community. Sometimes that was, um, you know, translating documents and making sure that people had access to uh, the court system 
it sometimes meant um, protesting policies on the Capitol Square, which is something that happens quite a bit in the capital city. Um, I think uh, certainly what is happening right now in the world is, is coming through those student organizations um, who are um, asking for change, um, certainly around the world, around the state and within our law school. And so our students um, have a history of being very vocal and being very active. And that's what frankly, law school is all about. Um, we do have a, a public interest law foundation as well for a lot of students that want to pursue that route. Many of those students um, will work throughout the country and a lot of their job opportunities are found through um, PILF and through working with our Career and Professional Development Office. Um, many students who ultimately want to work in social justice, uh, I, I will be honest, many of them end up working in DC and working for the federal government, which is um, a plus and I'll mention this as something that is unique to my state anyway. So we have what is called the diploma privilege where um, basically you take a certain course load, if you get a C average or better, you're automatically waived into the Wisconsin bar. You just need a license to, pack, to practice at the federal level. So many of our alumni in DC use that to practice out there and, um, and work in kind of the social justice setting, whether that is um, in the environmental law setting or in immigration law. Um, so I see Brad 528, I'm sure other schools wanna talk about their social justice efforts, but in a nutshell, that's what's happening um, at Madison. And then, like I said, many of our alumni end up in DC who ultimately pursue that path. Anybody would like, sorry, talk just distinct about your school. Well, I can chime in just, at, sorry. Oh, okay. I, I can chime in quickly just um, at Minnesota. We have um, a, a wonderful array of coursework um, concentrations ranging, you know, lots of public interest courses, many different types of advocacy. Um, we have our um, human rights concentration, immigration law. Um, we have the Human Rights Center here, which is a foremost um, is a center for uh, working with human rights issues. Some of our students have actually gone to Geneva with a professor who is um, a special rapporteur with the UN. Uh, so those are some fantastic opportunities our, ha our students have. But you know, closer to home, we have 25 different clinics here and those students are working with real clients advocating for them. Those are all people who typically cannot afford legal counsel, obviously. Um, and so many of those uh, clinics deal with family law, child advocacy. Um, we have uh, people working with businesses that were impacted by the, the riots here. So helping those businesses that were burned out and with their insurance claims. So those are just a few of the opportunities our students have, as well as we have the Innocence Project um, uh, housed here at the law school. So we have an Innocence uh, Law Clinic. Um, and then we also have the Minnesota Justice Foundation. So for students who want to get some pro bono work um, serving underserved communities, there's another opportunity. So yes, I believe all of our law schools have a lot of uh, social advocacy, social justice and advocacy opportunities for all of our students. Yeah, and we're about at time unless uh, Dean States or Dean Bird want to throw in a couple of social justice uh, uniqueness for your school. Um, but I think we're all as Big Ten schools, we all have very extensive programs. Um, students I know are very active. I've worked at, at, at one of these schools here and, and know all my colleagues and know that their students are very active and um, motivated uh, for some of the social justice issues. Um, I'm gonna, I just wanna say thank you to our panelists. Um, it's wonderful you were all here and uh, telling uh, the attendees about the great things um, at our law schools and certainly at the Big Ten Midwest law schools in particular. Um, any other questions you all have, you know, we're all online. All, a lot of information is on our website. Our emails are there if you want to set up, you know, personal appointments or I know a lot of us hold admission information sessions um, online. We'd be happy to sort of answer a lot of your questions further down the road. but. I'm just going to end it here and say good luck to all your attendees in your pursuit of legal education and my colleagues. I miss you in person, but at least I get you to see you on the screen. So thanks everybody for coming. You all take care now. <laughs>